When my tears turn to laughter That child long ago My soul starts to linger It's home I know If you catch me daydreaming Now and forever Thoughts are carrying me along To that place We call home Down that long road Throughout life we roam In the heart of Cumberland County in Nova Scotia, there is a place that is known throughout the world. Although a town of some prosperity, its name throughout its first hundred years would become synonymous with tragedy. The black gold of another era, coal. Its harvesting would bring on the growth and the near demise of the place that became known as the Miracle Town. It has been said of Spring Hill, that it has been knocked down several times since the late 1800s, but it has never, ever been knocked out. This is a poignant story, but a story that's inspiring as well. It's a story of resilience, of bouncing back, of a spirit unmatched. For as it looks toward the future in innovative ways, its determination is as perennial as its name, this spring on the hill this town in Nova Scotia. Towns are like people. They possess personalities. While some are shaped by culture, economics, and geography, others are profoundly affected by experience. Ralph Ross. Spring Hill might have been known to some as a town of tragedy, but Spring Hill is more known as a town of uh, spirit, uh, coming together, supportive. Something bad happens in your family. You can be sure that there's other, the next door neighbor is there to give you, a, give you a hand. So when you want to know why do people, why do people always keep coming back? I mean, 4,000 people left Spring Hill, but yet the 4,000, if they're living there, they'll be back. You can be sure of it because there was this bond and this unique bond that took place in Spring Hill. Didn't cease with the closure of the mines in 1958. A homecoming with Carl Demings. In 1958, after the last disaster, Mayor Ralph Gilroy, who was probably one of the most quoted persons that there was in the world at that time, said that there'll always be a Spring Hill. And I'm sure that that's what he had in mind. Is it because of this uh, knitting together? For Mary Willa Littler, a reunion means friends, former neighbors, the Miners Monument, and history. I guess I do have some special bonds to the monuments on Main Street because these men did work hard all their lives and maybe they weren't recognized for the work that they did while they were doing it. To be able to stand there and read the names on those stones and just see how many lives were affected by the work in the coal mines. Every year, generations return to celebrate roots. Coal gets in the blood. For Blaine Hayden, history lives in the story of the deeps. Uh, we'll be starting the underground tour in this last mine that operated in Spring Hill. 
When we get down, we'll be going down approximately 300 feet. Now, we'll be leaving this slope, going to, through this door into another decline where we'll be going down still a little bit further. The way of life in Spring Hill, the way I recall it, was it was a good life. People were very close in Spring Hill. There was that bond. And I think that bond was a bond of the coal mines. A bond that, made up, that was made up from fear, possibly uh, working in dangerous conditions. Maybe that brought people together. Because in Spring Hill, there, there, there was no discrimination between race, color, creed. There are the Hillers and the Rosers, those that lived in the rows of company houses, and Junction Rooters, the highest town in elevation in Nova Scotia to the Loyalists settling here in 1820, an abundance of spring water suggested the town's name. Well, the top of Spring Hill is 652 feet. So it's quite high and really not conducive to, uh, to agriculture where you want nice level land to work with. The early business in Spring Hill was just farming like it was in most areas around. Then later to that, there's an interesting story about a Mrs. Parks. The, she and her husband were traveling through the woods back of their farm and she kicked over a lump of coal. And this gave her husband an idea that there could be a mine in the area. OK. Now, we notice now, on either side of us, we see coal. Instead of the timbers we seen when we first entered the mine. Now this particular seam of coal is approximately 77 feet high and pitches about 28 degrees. And that'll carry that height and that pitch for the duration of this seam of coal. Now this particular seam of coal is a three mile block. The slope that we just left splits it in two. So we have a mile and a half of coal this way and a mile and a half of coal this way. I never realized the magnitude, the size of the mines until you roll out the map and you look at the hundreds of miles of tunnels. It's endless, endless interconnection of seams now filled with uh, water. Two and a half miles you'd walk down. For a distance of three miles, you had tunnels. And those all interconnected, you had a super humongous man-made radiator. Because not only did you have one of these, you had five of these mines, one sandwiched on top of another. By 1870, a company had been formed with outside interest to do exploratory work. And it was called the General Mining Association. And they found that there was extensive mines in this area. In those years, particularly around the advent of the uh, Intercolonial Railway coming to this area, there was a great need for coal that could operate the boilers on the locomotives. And Spring Hill had an excellent quality of coal for this purpose. It was low in sulfur, it was high in BTUs, and it was prized, really, by the, the railways. So by the time the rail line came through, people were very anxious to get this Spring Hill coal. Now, in here is an actual working section where two miners in a developing coal mine in the working the room and pillar system where two men would be sent in to extract and load out 10 ton of coal. Now, if I came down here with a buddy to work this section, I would make three safety observations. The first thing I would look for on the timber closest to the coal face, and on that timber, there should be a set of initials and a date. And once I seen the initials and the date, 
that would indicate to me that the mine official has been in and tested it for gas. In 1873, there would be about 200 persons in Spring Hill. By the early 1890s, there were between four and 5,000 people in Spring Hill. This would be a boom town. The population just mushroomed. The lure of a good wage saw 1,500 go underground in the first three decades. But it wasn't long before the town would reel from an encounter with fate. Spring Hill disasters, they were caused from different and various reasons. 1891 in particular was caused by an explosion of methane gas, which is uh, prevalent in the mines, and it, it bleeds out because it uh, is exposed to the air as the coal is mined. In the 1891 explosion, there were a number of men and boys that were living here and did not have friends or family to claim their bodies after the explosion. And so they were buried in a common lot in the cemetery, but it's called the stranger's lot. So it's a process of elimination to determine how many are actually buried there. That will continue to be a project for the next few years. The youngest one in the explosion of 1891 was a 12-year-old, but there were some that were even younger than that who were not killed. And so the conditions could not have been easy, and there were no labor laws. The company at that time needed the coal resources, so there was no long period of mourning. The mines went back into operation, within two weeks. What would make a miner work in what he knew was extremely dangerous conditions? He would dig a tunnel, just barely over his own size in height, and keep digging further into the earth, but yet knowing at any time he could lose his life. Going underground meant camaraderie and a paycheck. In the deepest coal mines on earth, a faith prevailed. Yet for the one industry town, nature, in the end, would rule destiny. Spring Hill is celebrated today as the hometown of singer Anne Marie. At the turn of the century, it was one of the most prosperous towns in Nova Scotia. Miners would arrive, following a way of life, and with that life existed a culture, partly ingrained in superstition. There are many stories around at the time, and there's a couple that are of particular interest to me. One was of the underground manager, underground mine manager, who was walking down deeper, deeper into the mines, and all of a sudden, his mother spoke and said, stop right where you're at. And he, he stopped. The odd part was his mother had been dead for several years. And just as he stopped, right in front of him, the mines collapsed, totally collapsed. If a man would meet a woman on the street when he was on his way to work, quite often he would turn around and go home because that was a bad omen and there could, it could present some kind of disaster for that particular day. In mining, there are certain stresses which happen because of this great weight. The pressure that produced the coal also produced stresses in the, in the structure. The miners used that technique of pressure to help them mine coal because they knew that if they allowed a certain amount of pressure to come on the coal seam, that it would then break off much easier than if they had to just pick it by hand without that pressure. Uh, but it also uh, produces some hazards. Okay, now I'm going to give you a light demonstration here. 
I'll turn my light out. I'll ring my buddy up on the surface, and he'll turn these lights out to give you an idea how dark dark really could be. Thursday, October 23rd, 1958. The number four mine explosion in 56, which took 39 lives, was a prelude to the hell of the number two mine on this day. Three miles down, the end for another 75 workers was the near final curtain for the town of Spring Hill. I was playing with my best friend, playing back at the house, and I still see the cloud uh, in the sky, a huge mushroom. It just overtook the sun. It was just astronomical in size. I eventually was allowed to go to the mines, to the site where the ambulances awaited for word from underground. And I, I can still recall standing with my best friend, who was of same age, who was waiting for his father to come, from, come up. I remember it, it hurts because he never did come up. The town is the holder of the Carnegie Medal for Collective Bravery. And at the Miners Monument today, the names of 429 workers bear witness to the story of a century of the deeps. Over a thousand men worked underground, two and a half miles underground, and under some very stressful conditions. The closeness, the relationship in Spring Hill, it, it was rather unique. They walked the streets together, they went to organizations together, they did everything together. So in terms of the social structure of the community, much of it was bound up by the closeness that people really needed to be able to cope with a, uh, a tension-filled environment in getting out the coal. Here in Spring Hill, in the days when Blue Jays sat on nests in the outfield, the fence busters ruled the diamond. Two men out and a man on first and second. That's right. We were leading one nothing. That's right. And, and I said to myself, out in yeah. center field, I said, he's not going to hit it over my head. That's I'll right. I'll tell you that. And he didn't, if he didn't bloop the damn thing over yeah. second base. And the hit game it. was religion for many a Spring Hiller, like veterans Aki Albert and Lawson Fowler, life below ground forging a community above. Baseball is an important part of Spring Hill. But it's important, it's that important that I'd be sitting there and I'd be watching, and all of a sudden, you'd watch over at the bind. The men were going to work. And all of a sudden, all it took was one miner to tip his water, for you didn't go underground without water. And all of a sudden, you seen a 1,000-man chain reaction of water being tip, 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 tip. And the first man would head back to get his seat at the ball game down in the park. Following the 1958 disaster, which was well known throughout not only Canada, but North America and the world, that because of the depth of the mining and the excessive overburden and extreme pressures, that it was no longer viable to operate in Spring Hill, particularly at that depth. So at that point in Spring Hill's life, there was a very dramatic transition. It was no longer one industry town. In fact, it had practically no industries. It was left with about nothing. Nothing. But perseverance and continuing to believe in opportunity, opportunity that, despite the past, still lay below ground. For years, I've been interested in the history of Spring Hill. My second interest has been in refrigeration. 
during some of my work with refrigeration, there was always one problem that kept coming up. When you designed a heat pump, you had to have an energy source other than electricity to get your energy out of. But I thought, well, you know, if only I had a large source of water that I could take the heat out of. And, and I would discuss this with my father, and then all of a sudden one day he said, and since the mines have shut off since 1958, I would think that the mines would be flooded. And he was right. So with an old pit hat and a light and a lamp, I entered into the old mine, into these old workings. Took one step forward. Oh, my heavens. My heart stopped right there. I had a man-made radiator, one of the biggest in the world, in North America, sitting here at my feet. Today, approximately 75% of industry, now located here, derives its heating through geothermal energy, part of nature's give and take in the collieries that once were. One of the beauties of geothermal energy is that this process is possible to reverse and have a cooling process. So then it becomes very similar to your refrigerator. Hundreds of men gave up their lives digging the tunnels. It's because what they have done, their toil, their, their hard work, wasn't in vain. Uh, what they've done is provided uh, an energy resource for the community. They were a unique bunch of men. They knew what they were doing. They are very skilled at what they'd done. But to spend one more day, I guess that would be my dream, just to go back and have a look at it again. I'm proud to be a spring heller. I think part of the, the present day personality of, of Spring Hill needs to be considered in light of what has happened in Spring Hill because the town changes because of lack of industry or a change in industry to ever forget the roots. Once a Spring Hiller, always a Spring Hiller. If towns are like people, Spring Hill is a family, baptized in the fires of adversity. In the end, it wears its medals with dignity, for way below, in its deepest core, flow the tides of a new day. To that place.